Hello and welcome to this lecture on the new right. Now, as we know, conservatism is all about pragmatism, adapting to changing circumstances in order to stay relevant. And so, for this reason, conservatism had grown to accept democracy uh, during the 19th century. And by the mid 20th century, it more or less accepted social democracy and its ideas of managed capitalism as well. Think about the post war consensus, the commitment to mixed economy. Uh, government ensuring full employment, um, welfare state, NHS, and so on and so forth. Conservatives have, conservatives have had, had adapted to this labour-initiated programme uh, in the 50s and 60s and so on because it seemed pragmatic to do so, both electorally and in terms of the economy. However, this changed with the emergence of the new right. Uh, this acceptance of social democracy in the post-war consensus changed with the emergence of the new right in the late 1970s in the UK and USA in particular, and then spreading to New Zealand, Australia, and much of Europe. Um, now, when we say the new right, basically we're talking about a blend, essentially, of, on the one hand, neoliberalism, that is kind of laissez-faire, free market uh, economics in, in the vein of classical liberalism, and on the other hand, neoconservatism, which you can think of as kind of social or state authoritarianism in many ways um, uh, focused on order and authority and discipline and so on uh, <clears throat> according to Hayward he says there's three three kind of characteristics as well beyond this of the new right he says it's radical um, it's, it promotes quite radical change in terms of rolling back uh, economic interventionist government and also permissive social values more about that later um, and is based on a radical ideological commitment to economic, radical economic theories and abstract principles, which is not something normally in line with traditional conservatism, is it? Radicalism and abstract ideas and so on. He also says it's reactionary in the sense that it's harking back to a kind of supposed golden age of Victorian values when there's economic prosperity and uh, moral fortitude and so on. And he says it was um, it was traditional also based on the appeal to traditional values and so on. So it's radical, it's reactionary and it's traditional. And to a certain extent, there's a whole debate in the literature over whether these are really compatible characteristics or whether New Right is full of internal contradictions. By the way, I should I should have said at the outset, this lecture is based on the Andrew Hayward chapter uh, in his book, Introduction to Political Ideologies, that's about the New Right. So, um, you know, before I get accused of plagiarism, just put that out there. This is nothing from me, really. This is no original thoughts of mine. This is based around um, Hayward's writing. So we can say that there was three real kind of sets of historic factors that led to the rise of the new right in the 1970s. Three sets of interrelated problems. Um, so on the one hand, we had economic problems uh, the, the, the world was in a recession, especially the Western world uh, in the 1970s, or at least a period of what was called stagflation, a combination of stagnation, low minimal economic growth and um, inflation, uh, which was unusual because normally these two things didn't happen together. You, 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 when you had stagnation, you usually had deflation. When you had inflation, you often had rising economic growth. So stagnation and inflation together stagflation was quite an unusual combination and the the, the new right and the neoliberals in particular blamed this on Keynesian economic policies of managed capitalism um, so uh, and that, what that did is that led many conservatives to then look back to earlier free market theories as a possible solution to the problems that they believed had been caused by Keynesianism and don't forget one nation conservatism by the 50s and 60s had come to accept and implement Keynesian economic policies themselves as well. So uh, the um, Keynesianism along with the One Nation brand of conservatism that had supported Keynesianism was to a certain extent discredited, you could say, by the 1970s. And this paved the way for the emergence of neoliberalism sort of push back state intervention return to earlier era of free market economics. Secondly, there was social problems or at least for the right for the new right they perceived uh, social problems there was a, an, an unease with the spread of what they called uh, liberal social permissiveness the idea that since the 60s a permissive 
society had emerged um, in which people were, there was too much of people being able to do their own thing. There was no real moral unity over what is, the, you know, the respect for traditional lifestyles and values and so on. Everyone doing their own thing, um, alternative lifestyles. And the New Right blamed this permissiveness on some of the changes in legislation in the 60s. Things like the abolition of the death penalty, legalization of homosexuality, um, uh, these kinds of things that were seen as uh, legalization of abortion, very importantly, that were seen as sort of um, undermining the previous kind of moral certainties that had glued society together and provided some kind of joint understanding of what a good social morality should be. And on the third, ha in, uh, in the third place, there were international problems, again, as perceived by the new right, uh, particularly growing fear about the military strength of the Soviet Union and the success of communism more generally, um, especially after really, really important the communist victory against the US in Vietnam um, in the early 1970s, as well as the Islamic Revolution in, uh, in Iran in 1979. Um, there was a fear in general that the sort of Western world was in decline, that it was losing the Cold War, the Soviet Union, the communist forces in general, uh, communist forces in particular, but also anti-Western forces in general, were kind of gaining ground globally and, and, and the Western powers were losing their uh, global power. Then in Britain, there was that general fear was exacerbated by, of course, the loss of empire from the 60s onwards. Uh, and, and there was a fear that Britain was losing its status as a great power. And that was linked also to European integration and f fear of Britain just being submerged into a kind of European super state and so on. So there was these three set of interrelated uh, problems in the eyes of the new right. Economic problems, social problems, permissiveness and so on that they didn't like. The decline of Western power, international problems. And for all of these three sets of problems, the new right believed that they had found the solution, the, the, the recipe needed to push back and reverse all of these trends uh, that they were worried about. So, as I said, the new right is a combination of neoliberalism in the economic sphere, neoconservatism in a kind of social sphere, moral sphere, if you like. Uh, so we'll look at each of those in turn. So first of all, neoliberalism, which is the economic side of the new right, was heavily influenced, as I said, by classical liberal ideas about the economy basically which saw the, the, the private sector as good and efficient and even morally good and the, the, the public sector, the state, anything connected to the state was seen as bad, basically a realm of unfreedom and coercion and inefficiency and so on. There was a, a, an idea that collectivism, kind of collective ownership, public ownership of industry, etc., restricted individual initiative, sapped people of their self-respect uh, and so on, uh, whereas individual self-reliance was to be encouraged. Um, and the market was respected as a mechanism that benefited the general good. So there was an idea that the state should keep out of economic affairs uh, and the market should basically be in charge of allocating resources and that would actually be more efficient, that would be better for everyone. So there was this commitment to the free market um, based particularly on the theories of Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman. These were considered the founding fathers, if you if you like, of neoliberalism. Um, Hayek was writing in the 40s, although his ideas were marginal until really the 70s, uh, and Friedman writing particularly in the 60s. And they, in turn, they'd resurrected basically the classical liberal economics of people like Adam Smith and David Ricardo. Now, they argued that modern industrial society was basically too complex to be managed successfully by government bureaucrats. So they argued state planning just didn't work. Yet the, the economy was just far too complex to respond, um, you know, to, to be responsive to, to, for, for, excuse me, for government officials and bureaucrats to be able to successfully respond to the needs of the consumer. You couldn't expect that to happen. And so any attempt of state planning of the economy was doomed to failure. And they would point to things that were happening in the Soviet Union by the 70s and 80s, long queues for bread and so on, constant shortages of, of one or other type of consumer good. And they said, look, this, this shows the inefficiency and the, the disaster of attempting state-planned economy. Um, but they extended their critique beyond just 
fully state-planned economy like the Soviet Union. They said even the managed capitalism that had taken hold in the Western world uh, after the Second World War, they said, look, any type of state interference in, in the economy kind of leads in the direction of the central planning disasters of the Soviet Union and therefore should be shunned and we should return to the glory days of the free market. Um, in particular, that people like Friedman criticised Keynes uh, for his emphasis on uh, on demand management. Friedman argued that, th that there's a natural rate of unemployment. Sounds quite a harsh thing to say. Um, but he ar argued that attempts by the government to create full employment through demand management simply made the under underlying problems worse, in particular by stoking inflation. So the, the, the neoliberals argued that actually inflation was the main economic problem uh, that government should worry about not unemployment. They argued if they got inflation down, then unemployment would kind of solve itself through the market laws of supply and demand. So <clears throat> they argued that Keynesian policies had stoked inflation, um, which had led to a decline in the value of money and therefore discouraged economic activity. And they argued that the, perhaps the only economic role for government should be dealing with inflation. This led to a policy adopted by Thatcher and Reagan. It was called monetarism which was a focus on reducing the supply of money in order to control inflation. And this was done largely by raising interest rates and reducing public spending. If you reduce public spending, then the government's putting less money into the economy. And if you... Um, this is Louis. And if you... Uh, <laughs> and 